So you know how everybody talks about how violent Chicago is, how much crime there is, whether it's robberies or homicides or whatever else, tons and tons of violence in Chicago, right? Well, I've been to Chicago. I thought it was gorgeous. I saw areas that were a little rougher looking than others, but I still really enjoyed Chicago. However, I would like to point out the fact that there could be a reason behind the high level of crime in Chicago. Could have something to do with the 27 buses carrying migrants that arrived in Chicago since Saturday, less than a week ago, as city moves forward with tent plan. Y'all, you see this? 27 buses, and by the way, two more have actually arrived since then, so 29 buses total. It says here, um, it talks about, listen, this is a Yahoo News article, right? And what I have gathered from this article is it was written by somebody who wants you to feel super amounts of empathy for the migrants that are coming across the border, the southern border, whether they are from Mexico, Venezuela, any other countries that are coming through the border. There is, I do want to talk about that. A lot of people, for some reason, want to equate immigrants or migrants with Mexicans. There's way more people than just those from Mexico that are crossing our southern border. There are tons of other countries right below us that migrate their way up and over our border. It's not all people, people from Mexico. So please keep that part in mind. But here, you know, they talk about how this woman, uh, this guy gets off a bus and he's looking for his wife who's in a detention center. And, you know, it's supposed to pull at your heartstrings. And I'm sure it should, um, but I, we're not going that route because this to me isn't about heartstrings. It's about the overflow of people and what our cities and states are doing to help the migrants versus doing to help us, doing to help the homeless population, right? So it says here, um, this person is more than uh, is just one of the hundreds of new migrants who arrived in Chicago in the past week with an uncertain future as the number of asylum seekers has surpassed 15,000 with the arrival of 27 buses since Saturday, 29 at this point. So over 15,000 people in a week have been sent to Chicago, um, including seven buses on Wednesday. With the city running out of room to house them as thousands sleep on police station floors and at airports awaiting shelter placement, Mayor Brandon Johnson on Wednesday defended his administration's decision to contract with a private security firm to help place the new asylum seekers in base camps before winter. What started as a political stunt by Texas Governor Greg Abbott in an effort to criticize the nation's immigration policies and relieve what he says are overburdened border towns in his state has turned into a full-blown crisis for Chicago and other sanctuary cities with volunteers scrambling to step up and fill in the gaps where the government can't or won't. I like how they use the word can't. Pretty sure it's the word won't. New York has seen surging numbers sent by the Texas governor overwhelming the city's homeless shelter system. Denver has resorted to buying one-way Greyhound and Amtrak tickets to other cities for recent arrivals. Now take this into consideration. Before we even get more into this, take this into consideration. The money for these cities that's supposed to be allocated for helping something, doing something, is now instead being spent on bus tickets to move people out of your city and into another city. It's basically like we're playing... Red Rover, Red Rover, and I know I've used this uh, analogy, metaphor. I don't, I don't remember what it's supposed to be considered. I'm not gonna lie; it's it's early, my dudes. Um, you're, it's like Red Rover, Red Rover. Please don't send whatever over, but we're sending them all over the place. So you have cities being overrun by migrants, who then the city officials go, "Hey, we we can't do this." You know, Chicago now looks like a small Hispanic town. It, like the, where, where's there's no I don't know how to phrase that. So then people start moving people out. The, the Colorado's like, hey, we can't do this. Put them on a bus. Put them on a train. Send them this way, that way. Cool. The bus companies and the train companies are making money. Downside is people are being shuffled around um, and the cities are using their resources for something they shouldn't have to use their resources for. If only our government would step up and do the correct thing and make it so you cannot cross the border. It. Some people would say Texas needs to step up a little bit also because it is their state that borders Mexico, um, where all the migrants are coming from, and again, not just Mexican migrants, but numerous from numerous countries. Maybe Texas needs to step up and try to do something more. I don't know what all Texas has in place to stop it, or if Texas can even stop it. If it's a, if it's a federal issue, can Texas as a state really do anything about it if our federal government is like, nah, let them in, let them in, and willy-nilly just allowing 15,000, you know, migrants a day to cross the southern border. So it says here, 
but the number of buses sent to Chicago by Abbott has ebbed and flowed while, sorry, the number of buses sent to Chicago by Abbott has ebbed and flowed over the past year. The two buses that arrived from El Paso, Texas over the weekend, the first from that city since December of 2022, could indicate that border crossings are at one of the highest rates in recent history, and the city could see an increase in buses in the coming weeks. I will say that that's not going to help somebody's uh, attempt to get reelected in 2024. Mm. Um, why can't we send a thousand people to Chicago? Asked Ruben Garcia, director of Annunciation House, a migrant shelter in El Paso, Texas, where numbers of migrants are also soaring. Obviously, Chicago isn't equipped, but we need to rise to the occasion. We should be prepared for whatever comes our way. I have an issue with that. We should not be prepared for an influx of migrants. We should be prepared to take care of our own people first. And I've said it day and night, and I'll continue to say it, and people will have issues with that, but I don't care if you have issues with that. Take care of your own home before you can help others. That's kind of how it works. The, uh, with resources strained in Texas, individuals such as Montilla are receiving all expenses paid tickets from the emergency departments in border cities, Del Rio, Eagle Pass, which we talked about last week, El Paso, Laredo, Brownsville, McAllen to sanctuary cities. Catholic charities in San Antonio are sending planes full of migrants to O'Hare International Airport. Y'all know how much a plane ticket costs? It's not cheap. Just going to put that out there. With nowhere to put new arrivals, Johnson on Wednesday defended his administration's decision to contract with a private security firm to help place them in base camps despite the company attracting controversy related to its handling of migrants elsewhere. Addressing reports after a special city council meeting, the mayor said we will never tolerate the violation of anyone's human rights. In his first public comments on the one-year agreement with Garda World Federal Services and its subsidiary Aegis Defense Services signed on September 12th. My administration has had very thorough conversations with Garda World, Johnson said, and so all those allegations that have been presented, I take into consideration all of those dynamics. The mayor did not answer another question about the deadline to move migrants out of Chicago police stations as winter looms, though he did say we're moving migrants into brick and mortar and at a rate that is expedited. Why are we moving migrants into brick and mortar when somebody who's been to Chicago could see the amount of homeless people, Chicagoans, if you will, on the streets? Why aren't we moving them into brick and mortar first? Why are we worried about the migrants going into brick and mortar first? I have issues with that. And again, I can understand how it sounds heartless, and I also don't care because you have got to take care of your own people first. Um, let's see. We are a sanctuary state. We are a sanctuary county, a sanctuary city, Johnson said. You know, this is a dynamic that we're all working to solve. I don't think anybody's working to solve the border crisis. That's the problem. We're trying to figure out how to deal with it once everybody is over the border, but we're not trying to figure out how to solve the border crisis itself. Uh, I watched the second pres Republican presidential debate, and that question was like non-answered or flitted around or BSed its way through every single time it was asked. Nobody wants to give a definitive answer on how to take care of the border crisis, right? Let's see. Um, where were we? It's incumbent upon all of us to continue our work and the sacrifices that we all have to make to ensure that families get a chance to resettle and really experience comfort here. I would much rather our veterans and our homeless men and women and children get settled and have comfort. Personally. Personally. As Johnson addressed reports, three buses of about 50 people each pulled up to the loading zone on a street by the Greyhound bus station downtown. Migrants carrying backpacks and trash bags, pregnant women and little girls wearing Crocs stepped off, walking onto Chicago streets for the first time. One bus came from Del Rio, one from El Paso, and one from Laredo. Some migrants with familial connections in Chicago got into vans and left. They were handed bags of mini cookies. That's cute. Um... And then cell, uh, city employees were asking who needs cell phones to make phone calls. Most, however, boarded school buses provided by the city that were parked nearby. The migrants would be dropped off at a police station where they would wait for a placement in one of the 21 city-run shelters. Now, it says here that Vene they, a lot of these people are coming from Venezuela, and they say Venezuela used to be such a rich country in oil, tourism, health care, everything. Chicago reminds me of a Venezuela of the past, according to one of the migrants. Here's the problem. 
the more people that cross the border that we are not prepared to take care of, to house, to whatever else, to feed, to clothe, to everything, the sooner your city is going to start to look like what Venezuela looked like. Your city is going to turn into, you know, Seattle with just an overrun homelessness and uh, drug addiction. And then <clears throat> in um, Pennsylvania, Kensington Avenue, I don't know what city that's in. I don't know what city that's in, but you're going to have the same kind of issues. It's going to happen. You're going to have an influx or a overabundance of um, crime because it, that's what happens when you want to eat, when you need to eat and you need something. A lot of people will resort to crime to make sure that that happens to take care of themselves and their families. So you're going to have an influx of crime. You're going to have more homelessness. You're going to have more drug use. You're going to have more issues. And then these cities are just going to deteriorate at a rapid pace, all because we are allowing our borders to be overrun without stopping it. Like what other country allows that? Name one, name one other country that just lets people willy nilly cross their borders and then they give them housing, they give them food, they give them money, they give them cell phones. It doesn't happen like that. We are like the only one. I went, we went into Canada over the summer. They searched our car. It was three of us. And they're like, mm, I don't know, three people. We're going to search your car. They searched our car. You have to go through a massive rigmarole to get in there. I, don't, I think that's the right word to get in there. <clears throat> and even on the way back into the, the U.S., there are little lax on the way back into the U.S. We noticed a massive difference between trying to get out of the country and into Canada versus trying to get out of Canada and back into the United States. The United States guy was like, do you have anything on you? And we we're like, no, he's like, cool. And just let us through Canada. Do you have anything on you? No. Mm, I kind of believe you, but we're going to search everybody's car just to be safe. We don't do any of that. We just let people say, no, 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 we're totally fine. And then we just let them in with no real sense of if it's true or not. Now, <clears throat> this other one here, hold on, let me, I looked up and said, you know, what is uh, Chicago doing to help its homeless people? Because if we're doing this much to help the migrants, what are, what are they doing as a city to help their own people? And according to this, um, if I can pull this up, city has spent only 15% of the $52 million in federal money dedicated for homeless programs. Two years after receiving the C-19 era, era funding, Chicago has been slow off the mark with some of its programs to help exper people experiencing homelessness. This is a new article. This isn't old. This is now. Okay. And it says here, um, da -da -da -da. hold on. Let's see. I'm going to read this to you the way it is. Okay. So there's a guy named David. He's like 35. He's been without housing for five years and witnessed how people like him are treated on the streets. Their tents are burned, slashed, or thrown away by city workers, right? So David, who asked that his last name not be used, usually stayed on the move, fearing his tent and belongings could be next. Only recently has he stayed longer in an encampment in Avondale on the northwest side when he made a friend. Still, it wasn't long before the city came through sorry, my nose itches, with workers slapping green signs on tents and nearby concrete pillars, warning of an upcoming cleaning that could see David's belongings along with those of his friends. Ow. And about five others tossed in the garbage. This is kind of like my dwelling. I live here. It's pretty much my house, David said. So I don't know if they can say you have to get the F out of Dodge like that, like at least help us with housing or something. Now, I will say that if you've been homeless for five years, have you done anything to try to better your own situation? Have you reached out to um, shelters? Have you tried to get cleaned up? Have you not cleaned up like drug wise, but like physically wise? Have you tried to see if there are jobs you can do for cash pay? Like I always wonder that about the homeless um, situation, like how many people are trying to not be homeless and how many people are just relying on the cities to take care of them while they're homeless. And I'm sure there's a, a good amount of both, right? It says here, the city has budgeted more than $200 million this year alone to provide services for people like David who are experiencing homelessness with much of that money coming from federal pandemic relief aid. But what the city's homelessness support system has actually spent so far tells a very different story because they're focused on the migrants. Um, though the city continues to expel people experiencing homelessness from its airports, underpasses, and L cars, it has spent at most only 15% out of one of the largest pots of federal money it was given for programs to help people experiencing homelessness get into housing faster, according to the city. And the clock is ticking for the city. Municipalities that received pandemic recovery funds must create a plan to use them by the end of 2024 and spend the funds for that plan by the end of 2026, according to the Chicago Recovery Plan. Other federal dollars the city received have a deadline of 2030. 
The city's recovery plan devotes $117 million to, into a range of homelessness support services, but they're waiting till the very last second to do anything with it. They could easily be spending that money instead of helping the homeless. They're using it to help the migrants right now. And then they're going to have to figure out some way to backtrack that and help their people at some point. Because if you do not use the money that was given to you um, for what it was given for, if you're a small business, they're going to rake you over the coals and take you to jail. If you're a city, though, does anything actually happen to them? It's not like you can, we're going to find them. They already spent your money. Like, how does this work? I'm curious. Um, the slow dispersal of federal money has stalled the launch of some new homelessness programs and pinched the budgets of some nonprofits looking for quicker payments. Some organizations <clears throat> say the city's approach to counting people experiencing homelessness, which involves going out on one of the coldest nights of the year to count people, underestimates the size of the problem. The city doesn't take into, into account people who live doubled up, which could include couch surfing with friends or family or other situations. Now, it says here that uh, in 2023, snapshot of residents experiencing homelessness on a single night jumped from 3,875 in 2022 to 6,139 in 2023. And that's the highest number of unhoused people logged in a city survey since 2015. For 2023, the city's Department of Family and Support Services, or DFSS, says in its estimate that 5,100 people live in shelters and another almost 1,000 are on the street or other locations not meant for human habitation. That same organization manages over 3,000 shelter beds at 50 facilities. Now, <clears throat> it says here, though the point in time count is a snapshot for a single night, organizations and city officials say the number is higher, potentially around 65,000 that's a much, much bigger number in case anybody's curious. It says here, the figure doesn't include Chicago public school students facing homelessness. The district has 16,000 kids currently enrolled, um, living in temporary situations. There are another 1600 youths connected to the school district, like those who have dropped out, who are missing or who have recently graduated, who are in temporary living situations. A CPS spokesman said, we actually just talked about yesterday's video, the amount of a thousand, a thousand kids have gone missing in Ohio alone this year with 45 of them in September alone in the Cleveland area. Watch that video and, and understand exactly what that means. Now you say to yourself, okay, well, Chicago is what it is. What about other, other places? Well, don't, don't forget that they're sending a lot of people over to New York as well. So I want to show you this, if I can get this to pull up this way. Um, maybe it won't work. Let me see if I can zoom. It's harder to do on an iPad than it is on my computer. So this little right here, very difficult to see. I understand. So what it says is New York has avoided the kinds of widespread encampments that are common in cities on the West Coast, largely because of a unique legal agreement that requires the city to provide a bed for anyone who requests one. No other major, major city in America has a similar mandate known as a right to shelter. Now, where are they giving them the beds? That's what I want to know. Where did the beds come from? That that would be a big issue. I need to look into that and figure out, like, do you as a homeowner have to give somebody a bed if there's a homeless person who wants somewhere to sleep? Because that seems very unsafe. Um, now, here it says, no, stop. If I can get into this thing. Oh, hold on. So I was about to read you this um, article for the New York Times uh, regarding New York, but I want to let you know that breaking news, Senator Dianne Feinstein, trailblazing California Democrat, dies at the age of 90. So there's that. You guys see that right there? She's, she died at 90. Again, I've said it before. There needs to be age limits on people who are in, um, in government situations or whatever else you want to call it. There needs to be time limits because 90 years old is huge. Imagine how old Biden would be if he gets reelected by the time he's done. Isn't he like 80, like low 80s? Isn't he the oldest president we've ever had? Anyway, hold on. All right, so let's go another route here. So New York City Mayor Eric Adams recently warned that the city could be destroyed if it doesn't get more help to support an influx of migrants and is now starting to turn some asylum seekers out of shelter. Never in my life have I had a problem that I did not see an ending to. I don't see an ending to this, the mayor said at a, at a town hall earlier this month. 
Since April of 2022, more than 116,000 migrants have arrived in New York City. Most came from the U.S.-Mexico border, fleeing hardship in their home countries and seeking asylum, a form of protection that would allow them to remain in the United States and not be deported. Many are not yet eligible to work in the United States due to asylum rules, which require migrants to wait about six months for a work permit. More than 60,000 of them remain in the city's shelter system, according to a statement from the mayor's office. If migration continues at its current pace, listen to this, the city is on track to spend $12 billion over the next three fiscal years to shelter and support immigrants. That has nothing to do with the homeless situation of New Yorkers themselves. That is only of immigrants. $12 billion in three years. And people wonder why it's so expensive to go travel places now because you have to, they have to recoup the money they're spending for the people who don't belong there. Uh, the crisis has deep roots. The United States immigration system has long been broken, amplifying an international humanitarian crisis. And the movement of migrants from the southern border into cities has highlighted and tested the system's many fault lines. It says here, a report from the Adams administration blames a litany of factors, including the lack of comprehensive federal immigration reform, Trump administration policies, climate change, overwhelmed immigration courts, and the narrow paths immigrants face to becoming permanent residents. Now, I like how they put Trump administration policies in there. Biden's in office now. Biden's not doing shit to stop it. So you can't blame it all on Trump. It's both of them. Adams says New York City has stretched itself to the limit and is demanding greater help from New York Governor Kathy Hochul. I never know how to say her name. And the Biden administration it says here New York's migrant crisis is actually several crises in one, a humanitarian crisis as people from around the world flee instability and poverty and make their way to New York, a housing crisis as a city that is required to find shelter for migrants struggles to do so. Have you, I mean, New York itself is expensive to live in. You get a, a 400 square foot room that your bedroom is your bathroom is your kitchen and you're paying like two grand a month. How are they going to do this with immigrants, right? Um, and then you also have the political crisis for the mayor whose handling of the situation has come under increasing scrutiny from fellow Democrats and from conservatives alike. Now, why are the migrants traveling to New York City? Well, some of it's because they're being shipped there by Texas Governor Greg Abbott. Part of the influx of migrants is by design. Since last year, Republican governors in Florida and Texas, DeSantis is one of them also, have sent new arrivals northward by bus or plane, including to New York City as part of an effort to provoke a reaction out of the federal government and Democrat-led cities. The greatest number has come from Texas, where Governor Greg Abbott has sent more than 13,300 migrants to New York City since the spring of 2022, but many more migrants have arrived on their own. Some experts believe migrants are choosing New York City after learning about the city's right to shelter mandate. New York City has a unique legal obligation to find placement for asylum seekers under a consent decree, which took effect in the 1980s after a court ordered the city to provide temporary housing to any man who asked for it. I guess you can't have the Statue of Liberty sitting there and then at the same time turn people away. I'm guessing that's why, how that works. In the early stages, we should probably not have actively encouraged shelter. Oh, you don't say. News of the welcome mat certainly spread among immigrant circles through social media very quickly. Um, says, um, I can't say this person's name, but they're a fellow at the Migration Policy Institute, a nonpartisan think tank. Um, and they told that to the New Yorker. The idea was, if you get to the border, tell people you want to take a bus to New York City. We should have just kept the old practice that people will just find their own way when they come to the city. Now, when um, Abbott sent migrants to the city by bus, Adams greeted them at the Port Authority bus terminal in an effort to appear welcoming in contrast to Abbott's cruelty. But in the past few months, his administration has distributed flyers at the border to direct migrants away from traveling to New York City. Understand that you have a a <laughs> you have people standing at the border giving out pamphlets and directions on where to go that isn't their own city like it's like, a, a, you know, when you go to a different state, you know, they have those like, welcome to Florida places, welcome to Ohio, welcome to California. You have like those little travel stops. And now it's just like you cross the southern border into Texas or wherever. And now you have representatives from different states there with pamphlets to hand out to say, hey, listen, 
we're busy, we're full, don't come here. Or other ones to say, hey, well, we have to take you. There's a bed for you if you want to come this way. It is absolutely crazy to me. Many of the migrants traveling to New York City entered the United States through points of entry at the southern border to escape economic and political hardships in their country. For more than 7 million people who have left Venezuela, for example, economic collapse and a repressive government had made life in the country untenable. Venezuelan immigration to the U.S. has increased dramatically in recent years. As of September 2023, the U.S. has taken in about 545,000 Venezuelans, while Latin American and Caribbean countries have taken in more than 6 million, which is crazy, especially since we just talked last week also about the fact that we, as a country, just decided to give all of the people from Venezuela work permits. So they can go and take jobs and, and things like that. And, and I know, again, sounds hard, sounds uh, heartless, whatever else. It is what it is. I, I have an issue with all of it. And it's getting worse and worse and worse. I mean, there's, there's no end in sight because nobody in the government is doing anything to put an end to it, to stop it, to make some reach out to other countries my dudes and like figure out how they're doing it and do the same thing like why are we having such an issue with with border crossing why have we not figured this out since the beginning of the country why have we not figured out how to i don't know i have an issue with all of it and i again i know it sounds heartless and it's not meant to be yes i feel bad for you know the women and children and the men but when you see mostly men crossing the border and then you hear of the uptick in crime in a lot of places. It, it's easy to put two and two together. You know what I'm saying? So I don't know if this president could fix it since he hasn't done anything to do it yet. Hopefully the next president can if there's a different president, whether it's Republican, Democratic, Independent. As long as it's somebody who can get in there and do something to fix things, please. <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? So I just want to bring that to your attention, y'all. It was important and the whole breaking news of the the death of diane what i can't find feinstein what's her last name y'all i can never remember her last name because i don't really pay attention to the democratic um leaders if you will and now i don't remember how to get back to where i was to say her name fine D diane fine y'all i know this is killing you it's killing me too because i cannot remember her name i have not had enough coffee today come on yeah diane feinstein i was right okay 90 years old well that's what we've got for today. Listen, I love y'all, Squirrel Tribe. Thanks for hanging out. I'll see you again later. Bye.